sick of one of her ones, but they don't like it this morning. Some of her seats are kind of kind of sparse this morning. But uh, we will continue on like we like we normally do, uh, striving to teach God's word and making it just as plain as we possibly can, so that people will understand and know in this day and time what still requires of us as Christians. Now, I know a lot of a lot of different organizations teach a totally different thing than we do, but that's that's their that's their thing and that's their problem. Hopefully they'll they'll change their way before before time in. Anyway, most of you know I've been uh, taking my lessons out of this out of this little booklet. The first one was well, I believe in God. And it gives a lot of information on things that have been researched and have been mulled over throughout the years trying to prove that God did not exist and God did not create us and things happen in an entirely different way than what we know written in scripture that we did. The next one was why I believe in Christ. We found out he is our redeemer. He made it possible for us not being Jews, not being of the Jewish lineage, to still have a have a part in the, the life ever after ever after after we after we're obedient to his divine word. Today our lesson will be, I believe, in the church. And this is something that we all need to, to uh, be uh, associated with because Christ established His church. He did it on the day of Pentecost. And though people have tried to, throughout the ages, to prove them wrong and, and uh, what He stood for and what He did was all just a, a big, a big uh, show. We know it, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was Christ bringing the, the new gospel down to us. The gospel where we didn't have to take our our animals and our sacrifices to a high priest in order for him to pray our sins away, which it didn't. It didn't work. It didn't pray them away. It just rolled them forward year after year. So with the uh, with the Savior coming and making his sacrifices. He made it possible to be able to get through to God would have happened to go for a high priest or someone of the high standards that they had back right during the day. And so it was a it was a hard battle that uh, that Christ had to go through in order to establish His kingdom here on earth and get people, constrained people, to come in and worship the way. That's what God would have them to do. What we're reading this morning goes to Acts, Acts 20, 28, and 32. Acts 20, 28, and 32. Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and all the flock, all of which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseer, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Well, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves, save men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch, therefore, and remember that by the grace of time, the grace of three years, I cease not to warn everyone, night and day, with tears. And now, brethren, I command you to God, and go to the word of his, the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among of them, among all them which are saints. So that's our reading this morning from, from Acts, Acts the twentieth chapter. At this at this time, at this place, and I'll prove that go go to God's prayer and ask you to help yourself. I'll be praying. Father, morning we find Paul is he said because this is the last time that he will be speaking to those people 
at Ephesus, at the church at Ephesus. He's, he's going all the way and, and uh, taking the gospel to other places. And he, he gives those people a stern warning here. Now he's been with them for three, working with them for three years, teaching them what God would have them to do and how they would in the church and how they were to carry on his, his gospel and his teachings and gave, gave his souls to him. And when you look at this, and he warns him, he said, Take ye therefore yourself to all the flock, all of the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my mighty parting, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And those grieving, terrible wolves have been working against, against Christ and against His kingdom ever since, for about 2,000 years. And they have been they have been successful in causing a lot of people to go back out into the world and not be doing the will of God the way He had wrote it down for them to do. But doing it according to their own their own ideas and their own beliefs and not doing it according to the scriptures. And it's, it's sad because you see so many, so many of these different organizations that are growing so so huge in number and in buildings and all the things that you see around us. And, it, and it's sad knowing that they're not doing it exactly the way Christ told them to. They're not worshiping in Christ's name. They'll come up with another name and you talk to them about it and say, well, we're Church of Christ. We just we just don't we just don't wear His name on it. it kind of makes you think they're ashamed to wear His name does. And so you can you can see the the, the ravaging wolves have really remade an impact on Christ's church. Now when it was first established over there on the day of Pentecost, there was there was a thousand of souls. They were baptized into it. They were, they were glad to hear of a better way to please God. A better way to have the promise of heaven after the eternal life than what had been offered before by the prophets, and by Moses, and by Abraham, and all the ones who had gone on before. So it, uh, it makes us, should make us really, really thankful every Lord's Day. We should have a Thanksgiving every Lord's Day, not necessarily a, a meal where we're fed, but we should be thankful that we live in a in a free country where we can worship God in spirit and in truth. The way it's more direct and not the way some high priest tells us that we should do it. So in this day and time, many believe that a person can be a good Christian without being a member of any church. Is a church really necessary? That's a good question, isn't it? To those outside in the world who are following after their own their own opinions, their own ideas, it wouldn't be that much necessary. Once or twice a year, that that'd be fine. Uh, a lot of uh, we uh, commemorated death, burial, resurrection on the first day of every week. They may do it two or three times a year, maybe once a year. That's all. That's all. They, that's all they do. And so they they they're very away from what the Bible teaches. And it teaches us that upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to pray for them. And we still follow after their after their leadership. We know the Lord's way is the best way, the right way, the holy way of life. The best way is to know the Lord's way is to study the scriptures. They are God's voice to us today. They were true when the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles and prophets to write them. And they are true for all time. So after 2,000 years, his word is just as true as it was the day it was spoken. It's been, it's been uh, translated in a thousand different languages and all over the world so that people who don't speak English can still have the promise that we have by reading and studying God's word. When you mention the word church, people respond in a multitude of ways. Some think of the church as something good, but optional. Some think the church as an institution. Some think that the church is made up of pre-just, just, just 
preach us hypocrites. Some think the church needs to be inventing and it's now more like the culture of our times. Everyone seems to think that they know what the church should be like. Even folks who know or have never read a Bible or have not entered a church door in many years have an opinion about what the church should be. I'm sure you run into those folks, haven't you? Throughout our, throughout our time here, a lot, of, a lot of them have an idea about the way Christians should act and what Christians should do, but they, they're not taking part in it themselves. They're not, they're not setting an example. And so we've got to be careful when we go out there in the world and not fall into this trap of these ravening wolves that are still out there and who are desirous to keep you, get you away from studying the scriptures the way it's been written down. They all have an opinion. If their, if their opinion is not according to the scriptures, then it's not worth much of it. You have probably noticed that religion in America has changed. Many, many groups have become religious entertainment being used. Others have become like shopping malls. Some think that the primary purpose of church is to cater to our wants and desires. We have become self-centered, thinking Jesus ought to be our servant rather than thinking we ought to be his servant. It is no wonder some see the church as hostile, others see it as a waste of time. If you want to know what Christ envisioned for the church, that he built it, or what place it was in, his heart to the Lord never thought of the church as an option. It is necessary in his eyes. And it's been necessary for 22 years, and we've met necessary until the end of time, until Christ comes back to judge, to judge people and, and to make the decision as whether or not we are live close enough to what his word directs to inherit that eternal life that he's promised us. He said, I go to prayer place for you. I go to prayer place for you, I'll come again and receive it to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. Now, so he made a great promise to us, did <clears throat> Some people are still looking forward to that, that great day. And some people are should be dreading because it's not going to be a pleasant thing. So. But it's something that we have got to make our mind that we want to be a part of and continue on throughout our lifetime. Our text is from Acts 20, 28 to 32. Paul is meeting with the elders of the church at Ephesus. It is a very sad occasion as he is saying goodbye to them. He says this beginning in verse 28. And we don't need to go back and uh, go through that again. We've already read it, so we will go on down uh, beyond it. False religion, false churches should never stop our pursuit for true faith and true churches. No doubt they will try. They will do everything in their power to convince you that yeah, we're wrong. And one of the, one of the I guess, the most prevalent things I've heard throughout, throughout my time is, uh, you, you go to that church where, where they say they're the only one going to be saved. Uh, well, if that's what you want to call it, but uh, we, don't, we don't consider it that way. You know, we're not judges. Christ is God, Christ will be our judge. He's going to say whether or not we have, we have been beneficial to the church and we have edified the church and we've worked in the church and, and made it what it is today, you know. A strong, a strong uh, organization without, without any outward, outdoor interference, like from the government or from the people in higher, higher offices. And it gets, it gets to look more like day from day to day that with the powers that be, they, they seem to be coming up with the idea that they, they need to separate people from, from the churches and get them back out there doing what they think, what they want them to do and, and uh, looking up to them and, and, and worshiping them instead of worshiping God. Yes, the Lord Jesus considered the church as necessary. He wants everyone to be members of his church and to worship with the church regularly. The idea that you can be a good Christian and not be a member of the church is not from the heart of God. A close look at the New Testament revealed that the church is quite necessary and our relationship with the Lord. The church, the church James built does not belong to you or me. It belongs to the Lord. He built it. After Peter confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I also say unto you, 
as you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. Yet Jesus built his church, not even his death should prevent it. Not only his death, he's not even, um, though they put him in, the, in that grave, but he was in there for three days and three nights. It still didn't prevent him from building his church. And it, and it was carried on for now some 2,000 years. The church belongs to the Lord because he purchased it. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration, told the elders of the church at Ephesus in Acts 20 and 28, if you want to look at that, be on guard for yourself, for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to be shepherds. The church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And this is the only church that he that he purchased with his blood. And that is the church that wears his name. And I know there's many organizations out there that they, <coughs> they feel it. They're great numbers. And all their, all their great buildings and everything is impressing God. That's not what impresses God. What impresses God is obedience. Obedience because He has left us through His, through his Word, through the writings of the Apostles and the ones who have gone on before. Jesus loved the church enough to die for it. How can we think so little of it? The church must be precious, very precious, and the Lord uh, very precious to the Lord. The Bible reveals how closely related Christ is to the church in Ephesus 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. I gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Just as your, your head is inseparable, connected to your body, so Christ is inseparable, Connected to the church, just as your body does your will, as it is conceived in the brain, so the church does the will of the head, Jesus Christ. The church is the fullness of Christ. We must never, never, never separate Christ from his church or the church from Christ. You know, you look around out there in this day and time, you see all the, all the great things that man has been accomplished and the, the enticing things they put out there to and pops people to come worship with them and do as they say. And one thing I can think of right off hand is uh, the church in Tulsa, which is called the Rama Bible Church. And they're the ones that got all these Christmas lights. They got 10 acres of Christmas lights. It's so enormous you can drive through it if you can keep running over people wander around in her. Uh, we did last year when we went through it. Some of you may know that my grandson Josh is part of it. So they have they have a way of enticing people to follow after what they're doing instead of sticking with what God's word said. And it's sad. It's pretty really sad, especially when your own your own family uh, goes goes and becomes part of it. The church is extremely precious to the Lord. In fact, he considered the church as his bride. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, Husbands, love your wife, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, sanctify her, having cleansed her by the wash of water with the word, that he might present it to himself the church and all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that he should be holy, would be holy and blameless. But Christ had a vision for his church, a vision for that day and a vision for the future. And we're still part of that vision that he had. We're, we're hard-headed and we don't want to follow after man's opinion about how things should be. We'd rather follow the scriptures. And they have everything that we, we need to know there. But it's just a matter that we go to search them out. Or they're being taught. Jesus had gone to great lengths to bless them to sanctify the church. He wants her to be a radiant with glory. Jesus values the church. When people slander the church or make a trivial, trivial they mock them, it's all Jesus Christ. They're saying Jesus is foolish to sanctify and glorify the church. 
If he wants to make that man angry, just slander his mouth. Do you think that Lord Jesus would look kind on anyone who slanders his pride? <laughs> Not likely. And that's what they that's what they do. They have they have ideas about how things should be instead of what Christ left for them to be like. And it's sad, it's really sad. So you look at some of their some of their buildings that uh, they uh, they have built in order to hold a crowd. I remember Brother Paul when he was doing carpentry work. He worked on a Baptist church over in Silo Springs, and that thing is enormous. It is huge. And so they have a lot of a lot of people attending in there. They have to increase their building all the time. Four buildings. So it would be it'd be wonderful if people were still sticking to the scriptures and being able to do that. But it don't seem it don't seem like that's the way it's going. I remember I love to hear Billy Graham. It really, he really, he could really give a heartfelt <coughs> sermon. I mean, he had it, he had it down. He had it down there. And one thing that kind of amazed and disappointed me was when his sermon was through, instead of inviting people to be baptized into the church, he invited them to come forward and say the sinner's prayer. I give a lesson on the sinner's prayer. It's not, it's not written. In the scriptures, it's not something that the disciples left for us. It's something that fans come up with, and they committed the time. They made the time. I want to dispense the church that the Lord Jesus calls His bride from the worldly world today. Think when they hear the word church, all I'm speaking about is the Lord's church that is described in the New Testament. Many religious groups who call themselves churches are nothing like the New Testament church. They differ in name, in organization, in doctrine, in mission, and in worship. They're often more a reflection of our culture than what God intended His church to be. Some groups have so little spiritual value, I'm content. It is no wonder people are, see them as unnecessary. And you can believe that, can't you? And you can believe that in terms of things that they stand for. They, but, uh, they still seem to prosper growing up. These differences confuse and cause people to stray from the will of God. More than ever, people need to know the truth revealed in God's Word about the church. They need to think clearly about what God desires rather than be pulled into some false hope by something that calls itself a church but never graded from the church Jesus Christ built as found in the New Testament. The scripture clearly makes the church Jesus built is necessary for us to engage if you wish to please God. And that's the only way to please him by following his commandments. Why is the church so necessary? There are several reasons. First, the Lord adds though he saves to his church. When the Jews at Pentecost heard Peter preach, they were pierced to the heart and wanted to know what to do. Peter replied that they must repent, be baptized, for the forgiveness of their sins. Acts 2 and 41. So often those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. In verse 47, the Bible says, And the Lord was adding their number to the church day by day, those who were being saved. The Lord forgives sins of baptism, and he had baptized believers to his church. And he still does. So when a person is saved, the Lord adds them to this church. To be in a church means the Lord has saved you. The scripture never contemplate a person who is saved as a person who has not been baptized or a person who is not in the Lord's church. The Apostle Paul told the church at Colossae, For he, was, he was rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we, were, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Colossians 1 and 13 through 14. The forgiveness of sin. Isn't it wonderful? That we can tell how that blessing is this day and time 2,000 years later. Simply by going by what the scripture says and not going after the creed that some man has come up with. When John wrote to the seven churches of Asia in Revelation 1, he revealed to them what Christ had done for them. 
The Bible says in Revelation 1, 4 through 6, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace. Grace from who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. And the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. He has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. In him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. One who loved us, and not that he shed his blood on the cross, to make it possible for us to have everlasting life after this life is over. The book of Revelation addresses the people who had come into the kingdom and were priests of God. John taught that we Christians know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. First John 5 and 19. There are but two kingdoms, just two. The domain of darkness and the kingdom of God, God's beloved Son. To enter the church is to enter the kingdom of the beloved Son. So, we only have two options. We can either stagger on out through our lives and, and not obey scriptures and not be lost. Yeah. Or we can hear his word being taught or study it and find out there's things we must do in order to be pleasing unto God in order to have the promise of our everlasting life after this life is over. The Lord has spoken spoke of the church at uh, as it came to me, he said in Matthew 16, 18, Matthew, <coughs> I also say unto you that you are Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bound on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Why would the Lord build one thing and give Peter keys to something else? Good question, isn't it? He did not do that. The church is the kingdom of God today. And there's a lot of people who will put up a strong strength argument against that. They preach that the, the kingdom has yet to come. Christ's kingdom is going to be set up when he comes back. And those who are lucky enough to be in that kingdom that we can go ahead and start building the earth back up after his plans and burn off. We can build it back up. So they have a different story about everything else. How do I know that? Think about this. In that 20 and 28, you will recall that the Lord Jesus purchased church with his own blood. We have no record anywhere in the New Testament that the blood of Jesus or purchased anything but the church. But the 24 elders sang this new song in the Lord Jesus in Revelation 5, 9, and 10. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood. Men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to God. And they will reign upon the earth. So he said there's going to be a, a kingdom. And our kingdom was established when Christ, when Christ died. He, he died for that kingdom to purchase it. The same blood did not purchase two things. The church is that blood-bought kingdom. Second thing is church means you are blood, blood bought, but there are no promises of being blood bought to those outside the church. The church contains it and the cleanse, but those outside are still in sin. The kingdom contains priests to God, but outside there are no priests of God. The Bible says, Whosoever has the Son has life, whosoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. First John 5 and 12. Being in the Lord's church is vital to our eternal salvation. Ephesians 2 contrasts the difference between people who are in the world and outside of Christ. For those who come into Christ and His church, the Apostle Paul reminds those who come in out of paganism and Ephesus of what they were before they become members of the church of the body of Christ. So they had some strange, strange ways of doing things back before Christ came. And being, being in those paganistic places and worship things, and it was hard for them to be able to turn their back on because they enjoyed what they were doing. Some of them were high up in these, in these different uh, churches and organizations. 
And so they didn't want to give up their higher, higher up places so they, they didn't convert to Christ. They weren't baptized. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, you are once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, Ephesians 2 and 12. In verse 19 and 22, Paul describes them after they become Christians. So then you're no longer strangers than aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are God's household. Having, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the, corner, the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitly, fitly joined together. is going into a holy temple of the Lord, and then you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. The third dwelling a dwelling in the kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And we're part of that kingdom in the day and time that we're been baptized into Christ. Before they were strangers without hope and without God. But now as Christians, they are God's family, a fellow citizen of God's kingdom, the church. Third, the church is necessary because being in the church means being a member of God's family. Paul said in 1 Timothy 3 and 15, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the, of the truth. In this passage, Paul defines the church as God's household or family. The children of God are in his church. If you claim to be in God's family, but say church membership is unnecessary, you are confused. Be careful not. Be careful. Don't be deceived. Don't deceive yourself. The very act that puts one into the family of God also puts one into the church. Compare Galatians 3, 26 and 27. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Baptism is an act of faith that makes us children of God. First Corinthians 12 13. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Wherefore Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of that one spirit. Mm -hmm. This verse says that we are baptized into the body. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 1 and 22 teaches the body of Christ is a church. Therefore baptism is what makes us a child of God, and baptism is what puts us into the body of Christ, the church. For we realize the church is God's family, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the saved and bought by the blood of Jesus. See why the church is so important in God's eyes. Being a member of the Lord's church is not optional. Are you a member of the church? Jesus, Jesus is built. I hope so. Many people claim to be members of the church, but they are not acting. They have stopped worshiping a church and supporting it by their action. They have actually abandoned the church. And in some sense, they have, they have abandoned the Lord. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own ascending together, as of the habit of some, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day of drawing near. The Lord wants us to encourage us, offer to love and good work, to not forsake assembling with other Christians. You cannot encourage other Christians to stay faithful if you quit going to church all together. I know some of you cannot attend worship because of your health, and the Lord understands your situation. But if you can attend worship, yet chose to forsake meeting with the Lord Church, you are forsaking the Lord too. The Lord loves His people and knows His church. You ready? If you are, if you quit serving Him, He knows it. When you stop continuing, you also open the door to temptation of every kind. To stay. Spiritually healthy, stay in church. Become a member of the church and to be saved. Believe with all your heart that Jesus is, is the Christ, the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess Jesus as the Christ, and be baptized. When you are baptized, the blood of Jesus will wash away your sins and cause you to be added to the church. You will become a child of God, born again into his family. 
If you're a member of the Church of Christ and have stopped attending, well, then come back to the Lord and to the church. Get right with God before it's too late. So that's all I have on this. There's a lot of, a lot of information there that we as Christians need to be aware of and be attending faithfully. Faithfully attending the church. Some people just wait for someone to say something or do something that gives them reason to follow with the church. And it's sad. It really is. Really sad that they, that they take that attitude. So at this time, if you've never been baptized in Christ, the invitation is open to you. We find that we are to hear the word. After hearing the word, he says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Then he tells us to repent of our past sins, confess his name before men, and be buried with him in baptism. <coughs> Raised to walk in the of life. These are in to you. You can do all these and leave this out, and that's not going totally to do you any good. You've got to take part in the whole in the whole whole thing in order to become a part of the kingdom of, that Christ has built for you and that he has shed his blood for you. So if you hear you straight away and desire the front of the church, in any case, won't you come up and say anything you'll place it on?